Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today I want to talk to you about the Thor rocket and its evolution. I mean, it feels like a pretty good time for this given that we have Thor and Rocket back together on the big screen in a new movie. So, the Thor rocket, no raccoons, began life as the Thor Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile. In the 1950s, the US Air Force were getting into the ballistic missile game and they were developing the Atlas Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. However, the mighty Atlas was necessarily complex and ambitious to be able to achieve the range suggested by that intercontinental designation. And as a contingency, the much simpler Thor was developed, and the task of building it was given to the Douglas Aircraft Corporation, who produced the first ready-to-fly test vehicle in just seven months. So like the Atlas, Thor would be a semi-cryogenically fueled booster, but with only a single engine as opposed to the three-engine Atlas layout with its complicated staging system. So much simpler rocket, but at the expense of shorter range. Because it would lack the range of an ICBM, one of the design requirements of the Thor was that it would be able to be transported on an aircraft, and that limited the size to about 2.4 meters in diameter and about 20 meters long. Fully fueled, the Thor would mass about 50 tons, and propelled by a single rocket stage burning kerosene and liquid oxygen, it would be able to lob a warhead a couple of thousand miles. That's enough to get it from the UK to the Soviet Union. So the missiles would be built in the US, based in the UK, and hypothetically launched at the USSR. So development proceeded rapidly, and in 1957 the first test began, generally explosively, as they did in those days. They used an early version of the Rocketdyne LR-79 or with a conical nozzle. That only generated about 60 tons of thrust, but through the testing and evolution, they would improve this to a thrust of about 67 tons. This main engine would be paired with two LR-101 Vernier engines to provide steering and the final course corrections for the warhead. Together, the engine unit would be designated as the MB-3. So the Thor was op deployed operationally in 1960 as the Thor DM-18. British crews would operate the missiles out of silos, while the US personnel were on hand to activate the nuclear warheads. However, this arrangement was a short-term stopgap measure, which would be phased out in 1963 when proper ICBMs removed the need for those overseas bases. As also, as part of an agreement to sort of defuse the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Thor was being pulled from sites in the UK anyway. So the Thor's evolution to a launch vehicle would begin with Thor Able, and that happened before it was even deployed. They used the upper stages of the Vanguard, which is a hypergolic pressure-fed stage with an AJ-10 engine, and optionally an Altair solid rocket as the third stage. And this benefited from the larger Thor booster over the Vanguard. The first flights of this in 1958 were suborbital flights used to test re-entry vehicles for the Atlas rocket. But the Air Force began to use the rocket for scientific flights. They sent up biological payloads containing mice on suborbital space flights, most of which didn't end well for the mice. The first attempt at an orbital launch with the Thor Abel skipped the whole low Earth orbit domain entirely and shot straight for the moon in August of 1958. This would be the first attempt by any nation of launching a payload to the moon. Initially, the first flight was known as Abel 1, but now it's generally called Pioneer 0 since the spacecraft was very much part of the Pioneer lineage. Unfortunately, the flight ended after only 77 seconds when the booster suffered a catastrophic failure. Pioneer 1 would follow in October, and it would be the first rocket launched by NASA, which had only come into existence 11 days before the launch date. The Thor booster worked pretty well, but it did suffer guidance problems which left the satellite short of its target. And so the satellite did continue up to a very high orbit, collecting data on the way and returned to Earth about two days later. The Thor Able design would eventually launch NASA's Explorer 6 into orbit on August of 1960, uh, 1959, and Tyros-1, the first weather satellite in April of 1960, which would be the final flight of Thor Able. But Explorer 6 wasn't the first proper orbital launch by Thor because there was another Thor variant that had debuted in the meantime, the Thor Agena, and it would place a satellite into low Earth orbit 
first as part of the Discoverer program, which was the cover story for the Corona spy satellite program. Agena was a larger upper stage than the Able, and it would evolve into a fully functional satellite bus for Corona, but it would be derived from a missile designed for the B-58 Hustler, so some of the early test launches talk about the Thor Hustler launch vehicle. So Agena was more complex. It was powered by a Bell XLR81 turbopump fed hypergolic engine. That produced about seven tons of thrust for 120 seconds. The stage was about 1.5 meters in diameter and massed about four tons. It would be equipped with gyroscopes, horizon sensors, star trackers, attitude control thrusters, so they could orient the spacecraft to control its payload as required for the mission. Thor Agena could operate with payloads up to 250 kilograms. Now, there's actually a little bit of confusion about the first successful launch by a Thor Agena. You see, Discoverer 1 was launched in February of 1959, and at the time it was announced as a success, and many sources will still cite this as the first satellite as going into a polar orbit. But in the last couple of decades, declassified information has shown that it probably didn't reach a stable orbit and very likely re-entered over Antarctica. But the engineers at the time were a little too optimistic and eager to declare their mission a success based on what evidence they thought they saw. So anyway, this means that the first payload launched into low Earth orbit by a Thor rocket was Discoverer 2 in April of 1959. And this would also be the first launch to orbit by a two-stage rocket, which of course is mostly how modern rockets are designed these days. While this launch was part of the Corona program, the satellite was still a long way from being a fully functioning reconnaissance satellite. It took many launches. They launched over a dozen increasingly capable spacecraft under, until uh, Discoverer 14 became the first success to actually return the photographic film to the Earth for aerial recovery in August of 1960. Soon after this, the Agena stage was upgraded. Agena A became Agena B, and that doubled the length of the stage and obviously its performance because it had more fuel. This was also paired with a new DM21 booster, which had some upgrades, including a Block 2 engine that generated about 10% more thrust. This raised the payload capability to about 400 kilograms for the polar orbits used by the Corona program. And in 1962, they would also switch over to Agena B, uh, D, which was basically the same as Agena B, but it was now standardized. The same spacecraft could be put on an Atlas or a Titan or a Thor using the same hardware. So Thor Agena would actually become the most common pairing for the US Air Force. So, launching something, I, I don't know the exact number, but it's, it's under 200, but it's still a lot of Thor Agena rockets launched. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves. In 1960, we also saw the debut of two other Thor variants. Firstly, there was Thor Able Star, where the engineers basically fattened up the Able second stage into something that looked a little less comical. It was now 1.4 meters in diameter, 4.5 meters long and about four and a half tons. It was now able to launch payloads of about 150 kilograms. It still used the pressure-fed AJ-10 engine, but notably, Able Star was the first upper stage that was able to relight its engine in orbit. And so it would fly from 1960 to 1965, and the majority of the launches carried transit satellites, which would be the first space-based navigation network developed for the US Navy. Finally, in 1960, the most important second stage for the Thor arrived, the Delta. Uh, and this would become so integral to Thor that Thor Delta would ultimately drop the Thor part and become known as Delta. So NASA was founded and it basically set about commissioning a series of launch vehicles for its scientific missions. Things like Atlas Centaur and Saturn, but as an interim solution, Thor Delta was developed. The Delta name was because after Abel, Abel Star and Agena, it would be the fourth Thor variant and Delta is the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet. So. Thor Delta honestly wasn't that interesting at the time. It was essentially a Thor Able with a different name. Again, it used the top two stages of the Vanguard. I think the third stage was no longer optional, but there were lots of other changes that NASA made to the booster, right? They uh, 
mostly replace components that they thought were unreliable based on the vehicle's history. One thing was they, they took the guidance out, the inertial guidance system, and replaced it with a ground-based radio system. Also, while the Air Force uh, Thors had lost the fins, NASA kept them around, probably because they looked cool. So yeah, NASA had great success with the Thor Delta. Uh, they launched like a dozen of them, and the only one there was only one that was a failure, and that was a way better success rate than the Air Force were managing with their Thor Agena and Thor Abelstar. So Thor Delta would notably carry Telstar One, which was the first active relay communication satellite. And through NASA, through the 60s, NASA would evolve the Thor Delta, drop them on the Thor part, and for a while the case was that on the east coast you would have rockets launching called Delta, and on the west coast they would, similar rockets would launch and they would call them Thor. The last Thor launch from Florida was a suborbital re-entry vehicle test in 1965. And while it had been envisaged as a, an interim solution, Delta descendants would continue to fly up till 2018 with the last flight of Delta II from Vandenberg carrying the ISAT-2 mission. Now Delta IV is still technically flying with two launches left on the calendar, but it is so radically different from Delta II that I'm not sure that it counts as a descendant. Anyway, this video is all about Thor. And the US military continued to fly Thor Agena with the reconnaissance satellite payloads all the way through the 1960s, and along the way it made improvements to the booster to handle larger and more capable satellites that were required by those spies. In 1963, they introduced the Thrust Augmented Thor. This was uh, introduced with the then radical idea of taking three solid rocket motors, Thiokol Castor 1s, and strapping them around the core booster, giving the rocket a bit more of a kick at launch. This was the first rocket to use this approach. Once again, Thor setting the standards for modern rocketry. Anyway, the final Air Force Thor variant that was introduced was in 1966, and this used a new Thor advanced booster design, this known as Thorad. So the tanks were no longer tapered, they were stretched by about four and a half meters to make the first stage a lot bigger, and this was paired with upgraded Castor 2 solid rocket motors. It was still paired with the Agena D as the upper stage, which had also undergone some improvements over time, and by the time it stopped flying, the whole rocket was able to launch spy satellites massing about two tons. But I actually skipped over another variant that was introduced in the 60s, the Thor Burner. And these are sort of significant because they use boosters which had been part of the deployment to the UK, Project EMILY. So Thor Burner was used by the Defence Meteorological Satellite Programme, which was a secret weather programme focused on predicting the weather around the world, to make sure that those spy satellites that were being launched wouldn't waste any of their precious film taking pictures of cloud layers. So Thor Burner was a Thor booster with a solid rocket motor added as a second stage. Now initially they started out with the small Altair motors that were from the Vanguard, but quickly they upgraded to Thor Burner 2 which used larger Star 37 motors, and there was another version that had a, a third stage on top of that Star 37. So Thor Burner would fly uh, military weather satellites and other payloads from 1965 up until 1980 using those original boosters that were built in the 1950s. These would be the last launches labelled Thor. But in between that there was another life for some of those Thor boosters that were had been stationed in the UK. After those were returned to the US, many of those boosters then found themselves deployed in the South Pacific with nuclear warheads. Now, at that time, they weren't intended to hit ground targets anymore. Instead, these were being used to lob nuclear warheads to the edge of space and even higher for nuclear tests. So this included, of course, the infamous Starfish test shot, which uh, messed up electrical devices and communications all around the world for you know days and weeks to come. I mean, Thor, by the way, is the god of thunder, so it kind of makes sense that he would mess with electrical stuff. Uh, and another failure, by the way, result, resulted in a test warhead 
well, the test was aborted and the warhead fell back to the launch site and contaminated it. And, you know, again, if you know anything of the mythology surrounding Thor, you'd know that his signature weapon has a habit of returning to him, which is fine for a hammer, not so good for a nuclear warhead. But beyond this, uh, these tests, there were also many suborbital launches part of another program called uh, Project 437, which was top secret. This was an anti-satellite program which was intended to shoot down hostile satellites with nuclear warheads. Uh, so this was operational from 1964 to 1970. So technically, Thor was operational as an anti-satellite weapon much longer than it was operational in its original ballistic missile role. And so yeah, after Project 437 shut down, those boosters were shipped back to the US and some of those ended up being used as boosters for Thor Burner. So that is mostly a breakdown of all the Thor rockets. Depending upon how you count, there's something about 240 orbital Thor launches, there's maybe another 110 suborbital launches, and of course, if you slum it by introducing those Delta imposters, then sure, you get about 700 launches, which is not bad for something that was supposed to be a short-term stopgap until Atlas was ready for prime time. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.